Kia ora. Let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, what is 4 plus 2? It's 6. What is 4 minus 2? It's 2. What is 4 minus the string 2? It's 2. So 4 plus the string 2 must, of course, be 42. <laughs> Let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, is 1 equal to the string 1? Hands up for true. Hands up for false. It's true. Is 1 actually equal to the string 1? Hands up for true. Hands up for false. It's false. Let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, what is the concatenation of two empty lists? It's an empty string. What is the concatenation of an empty list and an empty object? It's the string object object. <laughs> what is the concatenation of an empty object and an empty list? It's zero. <laughs> what is the concatenation of two empty objects? It's not a number. <laughs> what? Who recognizes this duck and this talk? This is a talk by Gary Bernhardt. It's a four-minute WAT talk where he goes through a number of examples in JavaScript and Ruby. I have 30 minutes, so this isn't going to be a WAT talk. This is going to be a Y talk. I'm going to step through all these interesting little artifacts of various programming languages and explain to you not just the WAT, but the why. So let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, the issue we have here is about our operators and how they try to be useful for us. With this uh, negation here, negation only works between numbers. So each side of that equation is cast into a number, which is why the math works. However, the plus operator is overloaded. It could do either concatenation or addition. In this case, it's choosing to concatenate our two values together. In this particular example, we have an issue of type coercion again. The double equals implies type coercion by default. It will make both sides the same type. They added the triple equals to explicitly not do that, which is why you have two different types of equals. If you're going to be coding in JavaScript, you probably want to be using the triple equals all the time. And in this particular example, well, it's going to be a little bit complicated, because you know about 30 seconds ago where I hand waved that this operator does either concatenation or adding together? Yeah. Let's dive into that a little bit. Let's dive into ECMA 262, the 10th edition of the ECMAScript 2019 language specification, specifically section 12.8.3, the edition operator, which has a tiny little side note that says, the addition operator either performs string concatenation or numeric addition. So consider two variables, A and B. In order to do the plus operation, we need to work out which operation we need to perform, either addition or concatenation. In order to do that, we're provided an algorithm. Convert the two variables first to primitives. That is, when you run a type of against it, it'll either be undefined, a null, a Boolean, a number, or a string. To get that, you need to either run type of that value. Otherwise, if it's not then a primitive, go to string, and string will always return a string. Once we've dropped down into our primitive types, if either side of the equation is a string, then we're going to concatenate. Otherwise, we're going to cast them both to numbers and add them together. So consider one of our examples, which was the empty list and the empty object. First, we need to convert the empty list to a primitive. First, we're going to try the value of, and the value of an empty list is an empty list, and the type of that is going to be an object, because an empty list in JavaScript is considered an object, not a list or an array. It's an object. Yes, it's confusing. There are reasons. Because that didn't work and we're still in an object and not a primitive type, we then need to cast it to a string. So if we perform two string, we end up getting an empty list. This is because in a number of programming languages, a string is just a list of characters. And in this case, an empty list is no characters, therefore it's an empty string. And that empty string then is a string, which means we have the primitive of our left-hand side. So to the right-hand side, the empty object. First, we need to convert it to a primitive. That is, the type of has to be one of these types. First, we're going to try value of. And the value of an empty object is an empty object, and that's great. The type of that is an object, so we need to then cast it to a string which we can then do, but then we get object, object. 
Huh. JavaScript is older than a lot of people in this room, and JavaScript uses a method of showing what the value of an object is that doesn't gel with modern programming language paradigms. When you try to cast an object in JavaScript to a string, it will tell you that it's an object of type object, which isn't exactly the most useful. If you want to be using and returning a stringy representation of an object in JavaScript, you can use the default json.stringify. This is native in JavaScript, so you don't have to try to code your own. But it means that any object, if you try to print it out, it will always be object, object, no matter its contents. So now that we know that that's object, object, and the type of that string is a string, we then have our two primitives. And since at least one of those is a string, we're going to concatenate them together, which means that we get an empty string concatenated with the string object, object, which means we get object, object. So now that we have our two primitives, we can go through each of those four types and see exactly how every single permutation was a little bit different. When we concatenate two empty lists, they are the concatenation of two empty strings, which is an empty string. When we concatenate an empty list and an empty object, it is that concatenation that we saw earlier of the empty string and then the object object string, which is object object. However, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. Because we're running these examples in a uh, command line terminal interface, and in this particular example, I was using the Chrome developer console, that is an empty block. That is not an object. <laughs> so that is ignored by the terminal, and then we end up with a unary addition, <laughs> which means it's pretty much casting whatever that is to a number, and casting an empty string to a number gives us zero. And then for our final example here, we're going to be concatenating again with that empty object, and we're going to have the empty function concatenated with the unary addition of a string. The first character in that string is not a number, ergo, not a number. Therefore, the concatenation of two empty lists is an empty string. The concatenation of an empty string and an empty object is a string object object. The concatenation of an empty object and an empty list is zero, and the concatenation of two empty objects is not a number, ta-da. <laughs> Except, <laughs> because I was doing this in a terminal, we have that flawed logic happening where we were expecting an object to be an object, but it wasn't. It was actually an empty function. If we were to not, if we, if we were to script this in a JavaScript file, or if we were to say actually use variables, we end up getting different results because if we concatenate together the two empty lists, we still get the empty string. If we concatenate the empty list and the empty object when they're variables. We get the same thing, but once we flip it, we are no longer having the compiler assume that we have an empty function block, and so it's the same, which is really useful. And then our last example is the same again, and those, the second and third example is a, a, an example of commutivity. It's the same forwards as backers, which in math is really important, because in math, addition is commutative. You can go one plus two is the same as two plus one, so JavaScript follows math if you use it right. So JavaScript isn't awful. JavaScript is awful. <laughs> it's full of awe. And I have an hour-long dissertation on with that exact title if you look it up later. JavaScript is a 22 or 23 or 24, however old it is. It's older than a lot of people in this room. But it's 100% backwards compatible. The Space Jam website, written in 1995, uses JavaScript, and that still works on modern browsers today. JavaScript also won the language wars, beating such formidable foes as Flash, Visual Basic, JScript, and ActiveScript. Thank goodness. However, if you don't understand the design constraints and considerations, you might think that JavaScript is just terrible. So don't use it. There are many other programming languages that you can use in the browser. You can use JavaScript. Or you could use one of the many languages and projects and programs that compiles, compiles any language you want down into JavaScript. And there are hundreds to choose from. There's COBOL script in there. There's uh, JS Haskell. There's Clojure JS. There's any, there's a Prolog one in there. Wow, OK. Um, there's Batavia in there as well, which is a project that I helped write. Come find me afterwards. I have stickers. But in all seriousness, just because you can use any other language doesn't mean you can avoid edge cases. You cannot avoid foot guns. You cannot avoid WATs. Using another language will not save you. 
Let's talk about Ruby. In Ruby, this statement, not true, double and false. Who thinks that this will be true? Who thinks that this will be false? It's true. However, not true and false. Who thinks this is going to be true? Who thinks this is going to be false? It's false. This is because in Ruby, there is double and, double pipe, and 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 or. They are not the same operators. In the order of precedence that Ruby has, not sits right there between them. Which means that you end up getting these implied brackets in your order of operations, which means that these two statements aren't the same. If you're going to be coding in Ruby, choose one form and stick to it, otherwise this will get you. Let's talk about Python. In Python, if I have the variable A is 256 and the variable B is 256, is A B? Hands up for true, hands up for false. It's true. If I have a variable A is 257 and the variable B is 257, is A B? True, false. It's false. However, if I declare them on the same line and check it, they are. <laughs> Let's talk about Python. <laughs> In Python, when you load the interpreter, you're probably going to be running C Python. If you think you're running Python, you're probably running C Python. If you know you're running something else, you probably are. But 99% of the time, it's going to be C Python unless you're using one of those other ones. So when C Python loads up, it optimizes for you by creating a cache of integers from negative 5 to 256. And it will optimize as many integers as it can. When it sees that we declare the variable A as 256, it will store A as being already in this cache. Then we when we declare B, it uses that same part of cache. So when we do is an identity check, not a quality, not whether the values are the same, whether they're the actual same thing, the same object, the same place in memory, and they are, we get true. However, when we try to declare a value that's outside of our integer cache, C Python stores that somewhere else. And then when we do this again, it stores the value somewhere else. And so if we check, these values are not the identical same object, therefore this fails. However, when we declare them on the same line, it optimizes for us. It stores the values in the same place, and they are the same value, therefore our identity check works. So if you want to be actually checking for equality in Python, use the equality function um, operator, that would be super useful. And let's talk about the pub quiz about Python last night. <laughs> the last question was, if I declare a variable A and B, both being 250, then for a range of 250 through 260, if A is not B, break, otherwise increment both, and then at the end of that for loop, print. What we're doing here is having, like, sorry, the result of that is 257. This was the correct answer for the quiz last night. So the underscore here is a not a requirement, but it's sort of a standard as we're not going to bother about this variable. All we're doing is just going to be running over this certain thing a number of times. This range here is going to go from 250 to 259. The end of that range is not included in its explanation. End. When you explode it out, it'll start at the start and then start negative one from the end. Is, remember, is identity, not equality. And then break is going to exit the for loop. So as soon as we hit that first break, we're going to exit the for loop and then print out what the variable A is. So if we were to run this up, we would then instantiate the integer cache. We would then, let's check to the part of the integer case we actually care about. And now. When we start at 250, our two variables will be in that integer cache. And then when we check whether they are not identical, if they are not identical, we're going to break. They are still the same, so we're going to increment them. We increment them, they go up the cache, and then we start our next value of the for loop. And then we check again, they're still the same value, so we're going to, they're the same value, and then we're going to inter increment again. And then we're going to keep going all the way up until we get to here. We're going to have problems as soon as we start to increment our values again, because they're going to be stored outside of the cache. Each of those operations happen at separate times. They are stored in separate bits of memory. So next, when we check, they are not going to be same. So we break, and then we print out our result. 
You're welcome. Let's talk about Python 2. In Python 2, is 4 less than 2? True? False. False. So Python 2 understands math. Great. So 4 is going to be greater than 2. Yes, it is. Is 4 greater than the string 2? Hands up for true. Hands up for false. It's false. Is the string 4 greater than the list of only 2? True. False. It's true. Well, that's a bit weird. Let's keep going. What about the string 4 and the list of only 4? True. False. It's true. What about the string 4 less than? Well, it's going to be false. I mean, that makes sense. But what about the string 4 and the number 4? Who thinks it's going to be true? Who thinks it's going to be false? It's false. But what about the, the list of only 4 and the number 4? Who thinks it's going to be true? Who thinks it's going to be false? It's false. And given what we've discovered so far, we can work out a statement where 4 less than just 4 less than string 4 is going to be true. So why is it so? Let's jump again to the specifications. Python 2.7.15 section 5.3 comparisons. Objects of different types, except numerical types and different string types, never compare equal. Such objects are ordered consistently but arbitrarily so that sorting a heterogeneous array yields a consistent result. That's fine. That makes sense. The problem is there is a little tiny footnote. See Python implementation detail. Objects of different types except numbers are ordered by their type names. <laughs> so in this example, if we were to check the types of these three, we would get an integer, <laughs> a list, and a string. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S. So we get that. Now, if we run the same example in Python 3, we get a type error. Yeah. If you're still using Python 2, this is a friendly reminder that you have 129 days to upgrade. <laughs> Come find me afterwards. I have those wonderful rest in peace Python 2 graveyard stickers. I have many stickers. Let's talk about Java. If I have an integer A as 128 and an integer B as 128, is A less than or equal to B? True? False. It's true. So A is going to be greater than or equal to B, right? True? False. True. So if A is greater than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to B. They should be the same, right? Hands up for true. Hands up for false. There are no trick questions here. There are just interesting edge cases, because they're not. This is because in Java, the double equals when you deal with integer class items is an identity check, which means that it's going to check whether the values are the same. And Java has an integer cache. And its integer case goes from one, negative 127 to 127, which is the exact same issues that we ran into in CPython, just for a different range. So what you should be doing is you should either be using dot equals when you're dealing with integer class objects, or you should be using the primitive int type. Integers and ints are not the same. All languages have quirks. All these may have been seen to be weird or uh, or why, but when you have a deep understanding of how a language works, it's not a quirk, it's how the language works. Let's talk about Perl. <laughs> In Perl, if I want to check whether the string A is equal to the string B, and if it is, I want to print true, and if it isn't, I want to print false, who thinks that this will print true? Who thinks that this will print false? It's true. This is because in Perl, double equals is numeric equality, which means that it will cast both sides of the equation into numbers and then check. And because neither of these is a digit character, they will both cast to zero, and zero is equal to zero. What you should be using is using string equality if you're trying to compare strings in Perl. Let's talk about bash. In bash, what is four plus two? Command not found. <laughs> 
But that's okay, because BASH is a terminal. It doesn't understand arithmetic. So what you need to do is you need to wrap it up in a little set of characters that means actually execute this. So what is the execution of 4 plus 2? It's command not found, because what you actually have to do is double wrap it if you want to actually execute it. So what is the actual execution of 4 plus 2? Not 6, <laughs> because bash is a terminal, which means you actually have to print it out. This is by design. Bash is designed for execution, not for math. You can make it do math, but you have to ask it really nicely. Let's talk about Haskell. In Haskell, if I declare the variable a is 2 plus 2, what is a going to be? 4. Four. If I declare the variable b as 2 plus 2, where 2 plus 2 equals 5, what is b? <laughs> It's five. <laughs> this is an example of pattern matching in Haskell. This is an extremely powerful thing that you can do in a lot of functional programs, where you can explicitly say, for this particular function that I have, if you see these exact variables, this is what I want you to do. If you're not used to that being a feature, it's really weird. But it means that you can write Fibonacci in just four lines of code. We have the function declaration at the top saying that we're going to, for a given integer, return an integer. If we're given zero, immediately return zero. If we're given one, immediately return one, else do our recursive Fibonacci thing. Which means that that exact declarative, that pattern matching, is the exact same thing that you would do in Python if you want to escape early. Functional programming is really fun, y'all. Let's talk about Pascal. In Pascal, if I declare a short program and I have an integer x, I declare integer x as 41 and I increment it and then I want to print out x equals 42. If I then execute this statement, it prints out true. That is because Pascal is one of those wonderful programs that has a different operator for assignment and equality. Equality in mathematics is a single equals. Pascal equality is a single equals, and that makes sense. Double equals, triple equals, what the heck, y'all? Having a colon and an equals for assignment in Pascal is lovely. More languages should use it if they have the opportunity. Let's talk about Elixir. In Elixir, if I declare a range that I'm going to enumerate over, for each element in that range, I want to have that number squared. From one to five, I'm gonna end up with the first five square numbers. If I do the exact operation again, but choose a different range from six to 10 and print out the square of that number, I get that. Dollar sign one ampersand capital Q D. So that's weird. <laughs> but if I was to do the exact same thing, and assign it into a variable, and then iterate over that variable list and print out each element, I get what we expect. This is interesting. I wonder what happens whether we choose a couple of random numbers in the range. We did one to five, we've done six to 10. How about 65 to 90? And this time we're just gonna print it out. We're not gonna do the square, we're just gonna go 65 to 90. We get the alphabet. <laughs> This is because Erlang is old. Elixir is based on Erlang, and Erlang uses a list of integers to represent a string. And unless you tell Elixir otherwise, it is going to try to be helpful for you. So if you happen to have a list of integers that happens to correspond to some of the ASCII code point set, it will say, oh, you meant a string. Blech. There are flags in Erlang and in Elixir to change this, but what you should be doing is not assuming that your terminal will print when you just put the variable in there. A lot of terminals will assume that when you just have the variable that you mean to print out the stringy representation. Elixir's not one of them. Let's talk about Scala. In Scala, what is the printed result of the concatenation of an empty object and an empty list, empty string? It is two parentheses. This is by design because in Scala, those two parentheses just mean empty output. It's not a new type. It's just, it worked out that nothing plus nothing is nothing, so I'm gonna show you nothing, but my terminal representation of nothing is going to be different characters than what you've actually seen before. 
And as soon as you realize that that's how Scala do, makes sense. No language is better than any other language. The mere fact that a programming language exists means years of work by many, many people building and developing a common dialect to describe and manipulate the realm in which it lives. Each have their own strengths. Let's talk about PHP. In PHP, there are ternary operators, which means that if we have a question mark and a colon, whatever is on the left-hand side of the question mark, if that statement is true, it will execute the left-hand side of the colon. Otherwise, it'll execute the right-hand side of the colon. So in this particular example, since it's true, it will print true. If it's false, it will print false. Python, that would be really good if you could do easy ternary expressions, but whatevs. However, you can also chain these together. In PHP, if I was to chain together false one, false two, three, who thinks that this will be one? Who thinks that this will be two? Who thinks that this will be three? It's three. If I were to change this example to false one, true, two, three, who thinks will, this will be one? Who thinks that this will be two? Who thinks that this will be three? It's two. What about true one, true, two, three? Who thinks that this will be one? Who thinks that this will be two? Who thinks that this will be three? It's two. Because ternary expressions in PHP are left associative, which means that what we assume will happen is because true is true, it'll print one, and then the rest of the stuff is just not gonna happen. What actually happens is that the ternary expression is so strong that it will evaluate the result of the first ternary expression before continuing to the next one. You should really avoid this, and this is one of the recommendations from our phpsadness.com. <laughs> because the chaining is left associative, it implies behavior that doesn't mesh with most standards of what we assume these sort of operations will look like. So, to prevent confusion, just avoid using these. Let's talk about PowerShell. In PowerShell, I want to check whether 36 is greater than 42. If it is, I want to print true, else I want to print false. Who thinks that this will be true? Who thinks that this will be false? It's false. What about if I wanted to print out if 36 is less than 42? If it's true, print true, otherwise print false. Who thinks that this will be true? Who thinks that this will be false? <laughs> the less than operator is reserved for future use because what we think of as the greater than operator is actually file redirection. <laughs> and if I was to cut out the file on my file system that has just appeared, which is 42, it has the contents 36. <laughs> Even though it reads as though it was a successful numeric comparison. Avoid these if you can. If you're going to be um, comparing numbers in uh, PowerShell, make it sure you actually use the comparison operators. That's super useful advice. I've gone through a dozen programming languages and shown what could be described in each as a WAT. But if you have a deep understanding of how the language works, it's not a WAT, it's how the language works. So whenever you find yourself thinking WAT, turn it into why. Find out why things are the way they are. Understand the reasoning behind the decision. It will help you get a deeper mastery of the language and you might just learn something new along the way. Because all these examples that I've come across, 80% of them have been my own wats. I am a polyglot programmer with mumble mumble years of experience and I used to be that person that said, I'm a Ruby developer, Python sucks, or I like JavaScript and Python 3 you can't actually use yet, which is a statement that I made on this stage several years ago in a lightning talk in Christchurch at Kiwi PyCon. I've grown, I've changed. I am much more respectful of every programming language and every practitioner of every programming language now. And if you're only proficient in Python, that is great, good for you. But why not try your hand at something else? You might learn something new, and it'll help you get a deeper understanding of your preferred language choice along the way. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>